Congresswoman Stefanik, people are, are listening around the country, but uh, our WABC, WRCN listeners are listening in New York. They can't believe this is happening right now. How did we get here? We got here because of authoritarian, unconstitutional leaders in our country, Brian, and uh, we've seen this in the healthcare sector when the vaccine mandate went into place. Uh, there was a hospital in my district, which was the first hospital in the country that announced that the maternity ward was closing because they were such staff shortages, they were not able to deliver babies. Uh, now we're seeing that this is impacting city workers and first responders, and of course in, uh, impacting the private sector with some of the larger businesses where there is the mandate that has uh, come down and, and embraced, unfortunately, by some of these businesses. But when we think about New York, Brian, New York has been in crisis for the past year. It has been unsafe. Crime yeah. rates have skyrocketed. And to penalize law enforcement officers, first responders, city workers who put their lives and health on the line, um, and many of them contracted COVID, have that natural immunity, they should be able to make that individual decision based upon conversations with their doctor. Now that you have all these crises from last year, it's only going to skyrocket this year. Already we're hearing of fire department companies uh, having to close. You saw an announcement. You saw an announcement this morning from one of the fire uh, chiefs that the wait times would be longer for first responders. Again, this is going to have really negative impacts on everyday New Yorkers. Right. 72% of FDNY workers have been vaccinated that by the November 1st deadline, meaning up to 4,000 workers might be terminated as soon as today, certainly put off on leave. Now they're asking for volunteer firefighters from upstate New York and Long Island to help them out and Staten Island. Forget it. They're not going to do that. Well, upstate New York, I mean, listen, I meet with the fire departments all the time in my district. We already face short staffing here. We're rural communities. Um, you know, the requirements is getting more and more onerous in order to get that certification required for fire departments. So we don't have extra labor to send down to the city. This is a self-made crisis by the mayor, Mayor de Blasio, by Governor Hochul. And New Yorkers are going to, unfortunately, pay the price, uh, both in terms of you know, longer response times, and I think you're going to continue to see crime increase. A couple other things, and it was pretty stunning news. I knew it was happening because I talked to people all the time. But as you find out with these uh, with these unaccompanied minors, they'll land, a lot of them are landing in New York. We saw that big story about three weeks ago. But do you know that thousands are already registered in New York area schools from Long Island, Nassau, Suffolk County, as well as uh, Queens County, uh, especially in Brooklyn, too, have thousands that have come here without even telling the superintendents. They show up. N n most don't speak the language. Most are teenage boys, and they're stuck in classrooms that are already overcrowded. Some don't even speak Spanish, and some have special needs. They're caught costing uh, our taxpayers in this area $24,000 per kid. How do they get away with this? Well, they shouldn't get away with it. This has been a lawless administration. I mean, look at the news, Brian, that the Biden administration is considering paying $450,000 to illegal immigrants who were separated at the border uh, a few years ago. That is only going to pour fuel on the fire of the already raging crisis at our southern border. But, you know, you talk about the $24,000. That's just, you know, one year. This is going to be a generational cost for American taxpayers. And it's not who we are as a country in terms of rewarding those who broke the law. We want to uh, make sure that we improve legal immigration in our country, which is what Republicans stand for, legal immigration, not continue to reward those who come here illegally. And again, we saw this past year is the highest number of illegal border crossings on our southern border in the past 30 years. September was the highest on record. That is only going to go up as the Biden administration is putting these you know, pro-amnesty policies in place. Yeah, yeah, these four counties, as I mentioned, New York, Brooklyn, Queens, Suffolk, Nassau, 5,000 kids. That's going to be an overall cost of the 28,000 kids, $139 million to taxpayers because it refuses to close the border or put together any of the policies that would slow it down and stop sending signals to Central and South America to come. So get this, in New York City, as you know, you get a free public education up to the age of 21 if you are here. Don't even have to prove citizenship, which means you're going to have a 20-year-old in high school sitting next to your teenager who might be affiliated already with MS-13. That's not a theory. The MS-13 gangs are here and they send them here with, with as unaccompanied minors. They give them jobs, they pretend to be students, and they could continue their gang activity in our country. 
It's, it's outrageous. I mean, it makes us less safe as New Yorkers. It makes this country less safe. And I know, having served with some of my downstate colleagues, downstate colleagues, the great Pete King, Lee Zeldin, uh, Garbarino, they have talked about the MS-13 crisis that's happening in New York State, and particularly the city areas. Um, and it puts the safety of our, our students at risk who sit in those classrooms. And it puts the taxpayers on the hook for generations to come. So let's take a look at the uh, Virginia governor's race and what it means for the country. Uh, Terry McAuliffe is beginning to panic after trying to adhere uh, Youngkin to Trump, even though every time he says, Trump endorsed me, thank you, but I'm running as my own candidate. He suddenly reversed himself yesterday. Cut five. But you know, Dan, this isn't about Trump. You know, so this is about what's happening here in Virginia. And it's not about Trump. It's about who's going to take Virginia to the next level, get us through this COVID crisis. Really? It's not about Trump? Is this strategy that they thought was so effective in getting Gavin Newsom, preventing him from being recalled? Is it now, are they realizing now it's got limited effectiveness? Well, that's all the Democrats have to run on, Brian. For the past four years during the Trump administration, all Democrats ran on was opposition to President Trump. And that is not a winning strategy, particularly as we're seeing how quickly the policies of Joe Biden are causing crisis after crisis in America. We have seen in just 10 months, unified Democratic government has led to a border crisis, a labor shortage crisis, a supply chain crisis, an inflation crisis, a constitutional crisis. And I I think Youngkin has the momentum behind him. He has had huge turnout of events. And it's not just Republicans. It's independents and Democrats who are fed up with the far left, um, you know, politically correct leadership. And the education issue is so, so important in Virginia. Glenn Youngkin has had a message for Virginia. Terry McAuliffe never has. No one can really say what his plans are for Virginia other than embracing far left socialist policies because he's obsessively tried to make this about President Trump. And Youngkin is focusing on the issues that matter, parental rights in schools when it comes to educating our kids, which I think that is going to be the key issue this election cycle, and it's why you see the poll numbers skyrocket for Youngkin. Uh, I want you to hear, just so you know, this uh, McAuliffe says it doesn't exist. That's an interesting tact. When there is, we, we could show you in the, in the curriculum where it exists. But Donna Shalala, if nothing, if not experienced, uh, the former Florida congresswoman was on This Week with George Stephanopoulos yesterday and said this about how she views it. Cut 15. I do think it's a local issue, but it's a national issue in the sense that Republicans are trying to undermine public education. I see it in Florida. I see it across the country that they actually are attacking public education. They don't like the teachers unions. Um, they don't like public schools. They want it's not just parents having more control. And I believe parents should have control and uh, and that's what we do with our school boards. But this is a very dangerous trend. And that's what we're seeing in Virginia. That's what we're seeing in Florida. So that's a totally different take, uh, Congresswoman Stefanik. That is the attack back at you. Yeah, well, the attack back at me, first of all, parents do have a role, and by law, we pass legislation funding K-12 through schools. Schools are required to have parental engagement policies. They're required to show curriculum to parents. That's not what we're seeing in the state of Virginia. That's not what we're seeing teachers' unions, who, by the way, were the ones that advocated for the shutdowns of schools, which put our kids at risk and have had significant learning loss. Republicans and, frankly, parents and Americans across this country are fighting to preserve and strengthen our public education system from this leftist delusion that the teachers unions have tried to put in place. And you know what's interesting? When I talk to teachers in my district who across the board are amazing, the unions are out of touch with the teachers, the people that want to prioritize the students every day. That's not the union heads. The teachers have faced these challenges. The unions are woefully out of touch with their own members. But parents are standing up of all political ideologies. Again, this is not a Republican or Democrat or independent issue. This is a about, you know, parents' rights. It's about constitutional rights. What is going on, would you say, with the reconciliation bill? We watched, uh, we thought there was going to be a vote on Tuesday. Now that's been put off. We thought there was going to be a vote on Friday. That's been put off. There was supposed to be a vote before President Biden left for Glasgow. He came and spoke and that there was no vote after that. What have, I know you're on the outside and they're not even trying to deal Republicans in, but what are you hearing? 
Well, Democrats continue to be in disarray, and they have a very slim majority, only four seats in the House, and of course, uh, the challenge that they face in the Senate. Um, so there's a couple of different dynamics going on. First of all, Democrats want to negotiate this behind closed doors. They don't want the American people to know all of the details in the bill. Um, we, as Republicans, are making sure every American knows that not only is the largest tax increase and the largest spending bill in our nation's history, but it has far left policy provisions like like mass amnesty, like providing the IRS with $80 billion to allow them to spy on every working American's bank account. It eliminates the bipartisan Hyde Amendment that protects taxpayer dollars not going to fund abortions. So these are socialist policies that Democrats don't want the American people to understand are in that bill. They are being controlled by the far left. Basically, Pelosi and Joe Biden, frankly, have to go to AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Pramila Jayapal, and say, you know, Mother May. I, can I bring this to the floor? And it's going to be loaded up with socialist provisions. Um, uh, you know, they don't have the votes today. What I think is going to be most interesting is how quickly, if they do get a deal, they bring this to the floor, Brian, because it's going to be a multi-thousand page bill, and no Democrat is going to have the ability to read that entire bill, and they're going to be on the hook for voting for it against the wishes of their constituents. And I think this is why you're seeing plummeting approval numbers when it comes to Democratic leadership, Joe Biden's failed leadership of the country. Absolutely. And a GOP against Dems on issues, going to an NBC poll. Well, the big picture looks pretty good for you guys. On border, you have a 27% advantage. On inflation, a 24% advantage. On best equipped to handle crime, 22. National security, 21. The economy, 18. And overall, getting things done, 13%. It's been a long time since I need seen numbers this uh, comprehensive and pervasive in Republicans' favor. What about you? Yes, it's funny you mention that because I had that poll right up on my phone as we're doing this interview. And these are the crises that we've been highlighting as a House Republican conference and really making sure the American people understand that it's a result of Joe Biden, House Democrats, and Senate Democrats' failed policies. They have failed America. It's crisis after crisis. And we not only are going to expose these crises, but we're going to talk about strong leadership on all these issues when it comes to securing the border, stopping these massive massive spending packages to try to quell the inflation, supporting our law enforcement to make sure that we have safe cities, safe states in this country, and not this crime crisis that we're facing. The other poll number that I think is worthwhile to note is 7 in 10 adults, including almost half Democrats, believe the nation is headed in the wrong direction. That's, again, only after 10 months of failed policies from unified Democrat government. Wow. Thanks so much. Congresswoman, a lot going on. You are right back in the middle of it as part of the leadership team on the House side. She's chairman of the House Republican Conference. Elise Stefanik, thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. You got it.